Let's move on to our next item, which uh, relates to the conviction of Penelope Jackson. So Penelope Jackson, the retired accountant who last week was found guilty of the murder of her husband, David. She was sentenced to at least 18 years in prison. Um, I thought I'd get his heart, she told a 999 operator, but he hasn't got one. During her trial, her defence lawyer argued that she had lost control after years of abuse. The trial heard, for instance, that she had a tattoo above her right buttock that read property of David Jackson. The trial and the conviction has reignited the debate about whether women who are under who are, whether women are underprotected as victims and overpunished as perpetrators. A report published earlier this year by the Centre for Women's Justice pointed out that most domestic homicides are committed by men. Few, the few women who do kill their male partners have in general faced abuse, often quite prolonged abuse over a number of years, yet few are likely to be acquitted on grounds of self-defence. Reacting to Penelope Jackson's conviction, the solicitor and director of the Centre for Women's Justice, Harris, Harriet Wistrich, said, there needs to be a radical transformation of the criminal justice system, which is still steeped in misogynistic myths and stereotypes. Women are punished most severely if they resist, whereas men who snap and kill for no reason get off lightly. So when it comes to domestic homicides, is it one rule for male perpetrators, another for female perpetrators? Hannah, um, your thoughts on this? Um. I feel like I'm like a Daily Mail columnist in this group. Um, I, I have enormous respect for the work the Centre for Women's Justice does. I don't think this case was the best way of making the point they want to. Um, it seems to me that the fundamental difficulty Penelope Jackson's team had was the lack of evidence of coercive control and the lack of evidence that she had lost control. And... I didn't sit through the trial and I know what I've read in the papers, which is obviously quite selective. Um, but the jury clearly wasn't persuaded and the judge in his sentencing remarks talked about how he was quite confident that the, the attack was premeditated. There historically were a lot of difficulties. The, the defense used to be that people could use was provocation. So if somebody said something that was sort of really grievously insulting, um, or did something and, and you reacted in the heat of the moment, then that was a, a partial defense. And stereotypically that was used by men who found their wives in bed with somebody else, or um, in certain cases that the nagging defense was used. Um, there were also high profile cases of women who had suffered years and years of domestic abuse, who had killed their partners. And part of the work that was done in, in changing the law in this area was saying that characteristically women will often react differently to men, that uh, an immediate reaction um, is a more stereotypically masculine response, um, whereas women may take longer to react. So they hear the final insult and it takes a while to, to react. Or more problematically, um, if they know the partner is much physically stronger than them. In some, many of these cases, they'd waited for the partner to go to sleep which then meant they couldn't use the defense of having immediately lost control because they'd waited or they'd gone and got a weapon because again, in terms of physical strength, um, the only way really for a, a, say a smaller woman to kill a bigger man would be using a weapon. Whereas men in domestic violence tend to use, you know, they can use strangling or much more physical force. So there are different defenses and partial defenses open to, um, well, to all defendants. Um, I think some of the cases that have been compared, again, unfairly in this situation, I think, um, of the, I've had a complete brain freeze on the name, the man in Bristol who lost control um, and killed his wife during lockdown. He was suffering from an anxiety depression and she had said something and he said he, he lost control and strangled her. He was found guilty on the basis of diminished responsibility if somebody's found guilty of murder, the judge has very little discretion in their sentencing. So it's usually a starting point of 15 years. Um, if it's manslaughter by diminished responsibility, they've got much more flexibility. So I think comparing these cases is, is quite unfair. Um, 
there was a, a really interesting point somebody made on, on Twitter yesterday to me about how maybe we should be looking at diminished responsibility in more situations. So for example, teenage teenagers who we know many of those who commit murder have had traumatic brain injuries or you know haven't um, fully cognitively developed yet. So it, it's a very tricky area of the law um, and obviously these are very emotive examples. I think there, there may be issues around the use of loss of control which is quite a problematic defence anyway. I don't think this case is the best one to use as an example of, of sexism within the criminal justice system. Jo, did you... Um... Yeah, I just wanted to come in. I, I think that, you know, what you've just said, Hannah, is really illuminating. There's no, no two ways about it because it's, you know, an almost forensic excision of, of different sorts of cases and, and the way in which law plays out in the in, in the courts, you know, the, that kind of very grounded analysis. But, you know, the there's another part of me that's like, how long have we been actually having to have this conversation about differential outcomes? Um, and it just got me thinking as you were going through that really detailed, um, perhaps uh, adding subtlety to, to how we understand that case rather than just a kind of quick soundbite sort of analysis is how we can end up in, in, in societies that are marked by such profound sex-based inequalities, right? And that are structured by them. How we can end up in this place where the just administration of legal processes, which I think is what you were trying to say, there are different legal processes here, they were administered in a just way, ends up with fundamentally unjust outcomes. And, and by that, I don't mean, you know, individual cases and what individual sentences get, but rather when you look across the wash of the last, you know, several hundred years, the sort of punishments and, and lack of protections that women experience vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, over-protections, if you like, of male violence and under-policing of it. Do, do, do you follow what I mean? So I think it's kind of like we need to look at we need to look at those one off instances, both from that forensic point of view, but also then to put that forensic point of view, that legal point of view, that very, you know, that very clear um, analysis that you gave also into its wider social context so that we can think about change and continuity and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how we can change things, because let's face it, you know, the, the idea that you know, uh, women are being over-policed and under-protected. We've been talking about that since, oh, what, I don't know, the 70s? I think there have been significant changes, though. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the change from provocation to loss of control was a very significant mm -hmm. change. The Sally Challen case, where there was recognition of coercive and controlling behavior, the fact that coercive and controlling behavior became a criminal offense. Mm -hmm. I think the last maybe 20 years, you know, there's been quite significant legislative change. I think it would be, I was talking, um, I gave a, a seminar paper the other day about homicide laws and you know, governments don't want to take hold of it. It's, it's a boring technical piece of criminal law um, that's got very little political capital in it but you're absolutely right. It has such profound consequences. Mm. And, you know, because they're high profile cases, because they're totemic, if people have the sense that the criminal justice system discriminates against women, um, or, you know, I mean, equally, there would be people who'd argue from, from the other side as well, um, that we do need to review these laws and to see not just that they are equal on paper, but the way in which people are able to avail themselves of criminal defences is really important. And the Law Commission did a huge piece of work on homicide about 15 years ago that mm. was ignored because the government didn't particularly want to take it forward. I think it would be really important to, if, if you know, we have this Royal Commission on Criminal Justice, it's something they could perhaps take up or even slotting it into these inquiries into how women are treated in the criminal justice system because mm because of the lack of discretion in sentencing for murder. You know, if somebody is convicted, it's a mandatory life sentence. Yeah. It's a minimum 15 years in prison. Yeah. Um, so if we could get the law looked at again, I think that would be really important. On its own, it's not going to happen because there's nothing in it for politicians. But if we could maybe 
piggyback it on the back of issues that are of topical importance that could be really helpful that's really interesting the um the legal scholar um well, more than legal scholar um catherine mckinnon said wrote many years ago um in relation to laws on on sexual violence that the law defines rape from the male standpoint it, and as a result it doesn't prohibit rape it regulates it and i'm just wondering hannah just in closing just picking up on your earlier points is there an argument that you know that actually maybe uh, you know this was a just conviction in relation to what the current law is but an unfair conviction because the way that these kinds of cases are are treated is very much from the male standpoint again i this case from what i've read in the papers and that that's all i know um this doesn't strike me as the best example of that i think the difficulty they had was the lack of evidence of coercive control or that she had lost control and i think that's presumably what the jury thought there are cases you might be able to make a much better case for in this one okay thank you that's really that's really interesting and, uh...